So now thousands of years ago, the great philosopher Epicurus, founder of the great Epicurean school, said that people who worry about death are insane. He said, you worry so much about not being around after you turn 90 or 100 or 110 or whatever, but you didn't worry about the world before you were born. You weren't around then either. You don't, you don't lie awake at night thinking like, oh my gosh, you know, the Napoleonic Wars happened. I wasn't even here. That's bonkers. Another great philosopher, Simba of the Lion King, <laughs> speaks of life as this great spiral that eventually unwinds and death is just you sort of finding your proper place. And virtually every great world philosophical tradition has had noble, poetic things to say about not worrying about death, how unserious death is. And for literally millennia, probably millions of years of human evolution, every time someone has gotten a cancer diagnosis, all that is flown out the window. Death is terrifying. And we can talk about how wise we are and how comfortable with it we are, and yet when someone says to you, I have plucked for you the best tomato you will ever eat. This is fresh from my garden. This is in a heritage line of tomatoes that go back to Charlemagne, this is going to be the best tomato ever, but it will kill you. Who among us would say, give me the tomato? I would love that. You know, you could, well, maybe one, maybe Virginia. So you have, you can commit what we would think of as heinous crimes, and if you can prove that they are in self-defense, we'd say, oh, well, if it's a matter of life and death, that's not a crime at all. Insurance companies, who are often extremely stingy, will spend hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars keeping one person alive. We are terrified of death, and we flee from it. So today, when we hear Jesus say, I'm going to be, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be killed, and Peter says, Lord, God forbid that this should happen to you, that seems like a very natural, normal human response to someone you love saying that they're going to be killed. But what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. This seems like a really harsh response to a very like kind gesture, you know, best wishes, hope you don't die. Get behind me, Satan. And this is the guy, Peter, that he called the rock on whom he would build his church just last Sunday in our gospel. So why this extremely harsh performance review? Jesus here is not using an insult. He's not saying, you jerk. What does Satan do in the creation story in Genesis? Adam and Eve are living in this divine way. Their life is one of total gratitude and friendship with God. They receive everything they have as a gift directly from God. One Russian theologian talked about Adam and Eve reaching up like toddlers to the trees, receiving food from God's hand, life from God's hand. And Satan says, don't think in that divine way. Think in the human way. Say to yourself, I don't need God for this. I'm just going to take what I want for myself. And Christ says, Peter, you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So we have these two different human perspective ways of looking at death. On the one hand is YOLO, you only live once, carpe diem, drink now for tomorrow we die. This life is all you've got. This is where all the pleasure happens, so get as much of it now because soon enough you're not going to be here. Or we have Puritanism, live a dour, hardworking, extremely unpleasant life, with no pleasure whatsoever, so that you can defer it and have infinitely more in the afterlife. Unlimited Froyo in your celestial Lamborghini, that can be yours if only you defer all joy for now. But both of these, whether it's about my pleasure right now or my pleasure in the future, they're about me, me, me. It's all about myself. But Christ says, those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will gain it. If we put this on our newcomer's cards at St. Albans, 
I think no newcomers would ever come back, you know? You basically have to be slaughtered, maybe by Roman soldiers, and then you could really be a follower of Jesus. That's what it sounds like. But that's not what it is to lose your life for Christ. So if I am clinging to my life, to my perspective, to my judgments of others, to my well-being, to my tastes, me, 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 the opposite of that is not death. The opposite of that is love. It's living for others. It's living for God. It's living selflessly. And this is what Christ has commanded. If anyone wants to be my followers, take up the cross of self-sacrifice and live for God and for your neighbor. Live for others. So this is the life of all the great saints, living lives of generosity and patience and kindness and peace and joy. And when we see that, we might say, that's beautiful and for me, probably impossible. I am so far from that standard, I guess I'm not a follower of Christ. One great saint from Palestine uh, in the fifth century, Dorotheus of Gaza, was thinking about this problem. And he said, it's sort of like we see this ladder of perfection that God has set up for us, and it reaches all the way up into the stratosphere. And we believe that what we're being commanded to do is fly up to the top of that ladder to achieve total perfection, total love, total selflessness. And he says, if you think this, you have never climbed on a ladder before. That is not how ladders work. On a ladder, you have rungs for a reason. You climb one, and the next one, and the next one. Dorotheus of Gaza advises baby steps in the pursuit of holiness, baby steps in the pursuit of living a life in unity with God. But we might say, how do we even know what rung to start on? How do we know what step to work on? Fortunately, in Romans, Paul gives us the Pauline personality quiz. So he says, when someone betrays you, when someone mocks you, when someone persecutes you, how do you respond? Do you fantasize about vengeance? Do you fantasize about a cutting remark that you might make in the future? Or do you bless them? Do you pray for them? So with your exes, with members of your family, with politicians on the other side of the fence, whatever that fence is, how do you respond to them? Do you pray for them? Do you bless them? Do you feed them? Do you house them? Or do you think, that jerk, you know, I'd like to see him get his. Well, if that's the case, congratulations. You know a rung on which to start, to start living in kindness, generosity, even with those who hate you. Do you seek out those of high status, power, prestige, influence, impressiveness? Do you hope that to, to bask in their glory, maybe bask in your own glory? Or do you seek out those who are poor, those who are sick, those who are suffering, those who are alone to serve them? Well, if not, there's another rung. Congratulations. Here's something to work on. Paul also says in the wonderful King James language, be not wise in your own conceits. How deeply do you cling to your own pride, your own perspective, your own judgments of others? If tightly, it's another thing to work on, to live humbly, selflessly, clinging to God's perspective rather than your own. And little by little, as you climb this ladder, little by little as you let go of your life, let go of your pride, let go of your unkindness, let go of your judgments, you start to lose more and more of your life. And you take on more and more of the life of Christ. And the more you lose yourself and the more Christ you take on, the higher and higher you climb on that celestial ladder. Until it suddenly... In this life, here and now, you are living out Christ's eternal life in the world. And in the life to come, in entering into eternity, suddenly you just feel like the fullness of home. Amen.